Much like the central figure of today's video, too many men are volunteering to be wildly uncomfortable, except instead of being adrift at sea, they're stuck in a salty swamp of underwear sweat. That is a gross description. Fortunately, this video is sponsored by Sheath Underwear, which is completely revolutionizing the men's underwear game. Look, gentlemen, how many times have you been out on the town and things are just not going well down below, you know? underneath. You're too hot. Skin starting to itch. It's sticking to each other. Maybe there's a bit too much sweat and look, there's nothing less attractive than readjusting your pants. Fortunately, there is sheath underwear which is specifically built with you in mind. It has three individual compartments in here to keep everything cool and comfortable, including an inverted kangaroo pouch for... Well, you're Joey. It was invented by a literal US Army soldier when he was in Iraq because, in case you haven't heard, it's pretty hot there. Trust me, modern underwear that's ergonomically designed for the shape of your body is something you just have to try. Less chafing, less sticking, less smelling. So if you're still buying your underwear from the same brand that makes your socks, your undershirts, and your sister's bra, maybe it's time to give something a little more personalized to try. Right now, you guys can get 20% off sheath underwear just by clicking the link below and using the code BRAINFOOD at checkout. Alternatively, you can go to sheath underwear.com forward slash brain food. Same deal, 20% off. Do that and your dry, comfortable balls will thank you endlessly. Again, sheathunderwear.com forward slash brain food. Link below, 20% off. On the 23rd of December of 1952, Dr. Arlen Baumbar, a 28-year-old French physician, washed up on a beach in Barbados. He was emaciated, delirious, and covered in sores, having just crossed the Atlantic in a tiny 5-meter inflatable raft. But Baumbar was no hapless victim of a shipwreck or a plane crash. His grueling odyssey, in which he spent 62 days alone at sea without provisions, was entirely self-inflicted. For the good doctor was on an extraordinary mission to help all those lost at sea make it home alive. Baumbar was born on October the 27th, 1924, in Paris. After obtaining his medical degree, he began his professional career at a hospital in the port city of Boulogne. It was here in the spring of 1951 that he witnessed the event that sparked his interest in the science of surviving at sea. A fishing trawler had become lost in the fog and ran aground on the harbor mole. By the time she was discovered the next morning, all 43 of her crew had died of exposure. The tragedy had a profound impact on Bombard, who learned that nearly 200,000 people perished at sea every year. Further inspiration came on October the 3rd when the dinghy Baumbar and two friends were sailing in, broke down off the French coast and drifted for three days, at the end of which the three men were racked with insatiable thirst. The experience led Baumbar to wonder how long a castaway could theoretically survive without provisions. As he later wrote in his best-selling book, Voluntary Castaway, For some time I had made a study of the resistance of the human organism to privations. The problem of shipwreck survivors found its natural place in such a study. It had one special characteristic. The external conditions contributing to this particular form of human misery were not, as in the case of prisoners and the like, due to the malice of men, about which nothing could be done, nor were they due, like the famines of the Far East, to natural disasters, such as drought, against which one can do little. They depended on the natural elements, dangerous without doubt, but nevertheless rich enough in the necessities of life to ensure survival until the arrival of aid or the sighting of land. At the time, most searches for shipwreck survivors were called off after ten days, as few believed anyone could survive that long in the open ocean. But Baumbar came to doubt this assumption and believed that given sufficient knowledge, tools, and most importantly motivation, a castaway could survive almost indefinitely. I became convinced that in their studies of the capacity of the human organism to survive in such circumstances, the physiologists had not made enough of willpower and its influence on physical reactions. It is only necessary to recall the fasts of Gandhi, the polar expeditions of Scott and Amundsen, and the voyage of Captain Bly, who lived for 40 days on eight days' provisions. On October the 19th, 1951, Baumbar set up shop at the Oceanographic Institute in Monaco and began studying the minimum requirements for survival at sea. This involved breaking down the basic nutritional needs of the human body and determining the best means of obtaining each from the ocean. He determined that protein and lipids were easily obtained from eating fish, while nearly all essential vitamins and minerals could be found in plankton and algae. All that was missing was carbohydrates. Taking inspiration from the traditional diet of the Inuit, Bambar concluded that under extreme circumstances, the body could produce its own carbohydrates from stored fat. Recognizing that any provisions stored aboard a lifeboat or raft could potentially be washed away and lost, Baumbar drew up a minimum list of equipment which would allow a castaway to survive indefinitely at sea. This consisted of ultrafine nets for gathering plankton, lines and hooks for catching fish, and a harpoon for spearing larger fish. But Baumbar's most radical theories concerned the most vital element of all. 
water. While humans can survive 30 days or more without food, few can last more than a few days without water. Bamba's first recommended source of water was fish, which desalinate the water they take in and store it in their flesh. Thus, a castaway merely has to slice open a fish to obtain a ready source of potable water. But in cases where fish were not available, Bamba's advice was almost heretical. Let's drink seawater. Conventional wisdom held that drinking seawater was tantamount to suicide, with nautical lore abounding with tales of sailors who died agonizing deaths as their kidneys shut down. But Baumbar argued that it was not the seawater itself that killed, but the manner and quality in which it was consumed. Most sailors, he explained, only drank seawater as a last resort, long after fresh water had run out and dehydration had set in. The kidneys, already weakened by dehydration, were then finished off by the salt in the water. If Baumbar concluded a castaway started drinking drinking seawater before the onset of dehydration and limited his intake to three quarters of a litre per day, they could survive with fewer effects. While Bombard's findings were encouraging, he still had to convince others to adopt his recommendations. I soon realized that it would be quite easy, statistics in hand, to convince the scientists, but that winning over sailors would be a different matter. At any mention of my work, they invariably replied, that's all well in theory, it may make sense in laboratory, but it'll be quite another thing at sea, take my word for it. Baumbar thus decided to put his proverbial money where his mouth was in the most extreme way possible, by crossing the Atlantic without provisions just to prove it could be done. His experience drifting off the coast of France even suggested the ideal craft in which to undertake such a journey, a 4.5 meter long, horseshoe-shaped inflatable boat of the type now commonly known as a Zodiac. In anticipation of how his undertaking and survival theories might be received, Baumbar dubbed his craft Le Hertique, the Heretic. On the 25th of May 1952, Baumbar and English yachtsman Jack Palmer left Monaco on the first leg of the journey, which would take them across the Mediterranean to Tangier in Morocco. While intended as a test run for the main Atlantic crossing, the journey proved more grueling than anticipated, with both men suffering from the effects of hunger, thirst, and exhaustion. Even small cuts and scrapes failed to heal and turned into festering sores, and the salt water caused their skin to break out in rashes. After 16 days, Bambar and Palmer reached Menorca in the Balearic Islands, where they were finally able to enjoy a good meal and full night's sleep. The next day, however, Bombard learned that his sponsor had grown wary of their venture and was threatening to pull out, so he flew to Paris to sort out the situation. Eighteen days later, on the 29th of June, Bombard and Palmer departed Menorca for Tangier. This leg of the journey was even more harrowing than the last, with a rogue wave capsizing the boat and forcing Bombard and Palmer to be towed into Tangier with a passing ship. Once again, Bombard flew back to Paris, this time to marry his fiancée, Zinette Brunon, but when he returned to Tangier, he discovered that Palmer had a change of heart. Though Palmer claimed that he had family issues to deal with, it was clear that his grueling experience in the Mediterranean had put him off attempting the Atlantic crossing. Balbar, now on his own, pressed on to Casablanca and then to Las Palmas in the Canary Islands, arriving on September the 3rd. Then, for the third and final time, Balbar flew to Paris to witness the birth of his daughter. On the 19th of October 1952, Balbar set off from Las Palmas into the open Atlantic, bound for the Caribbean more than 4,000 kilometers away. Other than a sextant and navigational books, he carried almost no provisions. A package of food and a radio were packed on board, but these had been sealed by a notary to make it obvious if they'd been opened. Bombard swore to never touch them except in the direst of emergencies, so determined was he to survive on the sea's bounty alone. Within an hour, Bombard had lost sight of shore and was now truly on his own. His log entry on that first day was upbeat and optimistic, giving little hints of the ordeal which lay ahead. Morale excellent, but sun hot, very thirsty, drank a little seawater as the fish are still sulking, have only been able to catch about three pounds, quite insufficient to provide fresh water. However, this should improve. Eater seems much less salty than Mediterranean. Within days, however, hunger, thirst, sun, and salt water began to take their toll on Bombard's body. I lost the nail of the small toe of my right foot, and there is a strange rash, probably due to the salt, on the backs of my hands. I am afraid of getting boils, which I know would be terribly painful, and which I would not try to treat in order to give no false values to the experiment. I have a few antibiotics on board, but if I use them, each castaways may object that they had no medicaments. I have made up my mind only to use them as a last resort. But these physical afflictions were nothing compared to the crushing sense of isolation which soon overtook Bombard and which proved far worse than he had anticipated. Moments of isolation in ordinary life can soon be ended. It is just a question of going out the door into the street or dialing a number on the telephone to hear the voice of a friend. Isolation is merely a matter of isolating oneself, but total solitude is an oppressive thing and slowly wears down its lonely victim. It seemed sometimes as if the immense and absolute solitude of the ocean's expanse was concentrated right on top of me, as if my beating heart was the center of gravity of mass, which was at the time nothingness. I thought that solitude was something I would be able to master once I had become accustomed to its presence on board. 
I had been too presumptuous. It was not something I had carried with me, something that could be measured by the confines of myself or the boat. It was a vast presence which engulfed me. Its spell could not be broken any more than the horizons could be brought nearer. And if from time to time I talked aloud in order to hear my own voice, I only felt more alone, a hostage to silence. Yet despite these privations, Bomba had relatively little difficulty staying fed and hydrated. Fish, especially mahi-mahi or dolphin fish, were abundant and easily caught, and plankton, whose taste Bomba had compared to lobster puree, was in plentiful supply. In order to simulate the worst-case scenario for a castaway, Bomba constructed most of his fishing tools from available materials using string from his clothing for fish and fish hooks for bones. Occasionally, he managed to vary his diet by catching seabirds, whose flesh he described as delicious. It was encouraging evidence of the validity of his theories. But it was not all smooth sailing. On the 23rd day, gale force winds ripped Lertique's sail, forcing Bombard to repair it in the middle of a storm. Hunger and exhaustion also began to play tricks in his mind, with Bombard on several occasions hallucinating the sound of Schubert's Seventh Symphony. And in a prototype for Wilson, the basketball in the film Castaway, he began speaking to a doll his friends had given him in the Canaries for companionship. But in an environment as hostile as the open ocean, a moment's lapse of reason can prove deadly, as Bombard discovered on the 39th day, when an inflatable cushion he was lying on fell overboard. Without thinking, Bombard dove in after it, only for a gust of wind to start blowing Lerotique away. Mercifully, the raft's parachute-like sea anchor, which had become tangled, deployed just in time, and Bombard was able to catch up and climb back aboard. As the days and weeks of privation slipped past, Bombard gained a new perspective on life. It became almost impossible to realize that there were people on land living a regular life and attaching such importance to things as the clothes they wore. Under the broiling sun, the day more or less passed me by, I had returned to the primitive life. For 53 days, Bombard did not see another human soul. Then, on December the 10th, he spotted a ship, the freighter Arakaka, bound from Liverpool to British Guiana. Her crew brought her alongside the raft and asked Bombard if he needed assistance. To their utter confusion, Bombard said no and simply asked them to confirm his position and radio his wife that he was still alive. To his dismay, Bombard discovered that he had made a serious navigational error and was actually a thousand kilometers farther from his destination than he had thought. And when the crew reiterated their offer of assistance, Bombard found himself on the horns of a dilemma. I thought of my friends and the seafaring folk at Boulogne who would say, so you didn't get across the Atlantic after all. The 53 days the voyage lasted would have served no purpose. Although I had sufficiently proved my theory, the man in the street, or rather the ordinary seaman, would regard my giving up at this point as invalidating the whole experiment. If I was to be instrumental in saving all those human lives, then my success had to be complete. In the end, Bombard accepted the offer of a shower and a small meal of fried eggs, liver, cabbage, and fruit before carrying on with the rest of his voyage. It was an indulgence he would later come to regret. Before my little meal on the 53rd day, my food had been abnormal. Afterwards, losing all appetite for fish, I became undernourished. The human organism gradually accustoms itself to a change and diminution in the normal ration, but after a proper meal, the digestive system seems to say, there, things are back to normal again. I need to make no further special effort, rather like an athlete who stopped in the middle of a race and finds he cannot start again. The stomach becomes prey to a sort of despair. I lost more weight during the 12 days still remaining to land than in the 53 days prior to my meeting with the Arik Hacker. But stomach cramps and 14 days of diarrhea were the least of Bombard's problems as he encountered fierce storms which threatened to capsize his craft and wash him overboard. Unable to sleep even a moment for days on end, on many occasions Bombard came close to succumbing to the castaway's greatest enemy. The castaway must never give way to despair and should always remember when things seem at their worst that something will turn up and a situation may be changed. But neither should he let himself become too hopeful. It never does to forget that however unbearable an ideal may seem, there may be another to come which will efface the memory of the first. Nonetheless, in the event he was ever washed away and unable to regain his vessel, Bombard carried sleeping pills in his pocket so he would not have to suffer a drawn-out death from exposure. But he never had to use them, for on December the 23rd, 13 days after his encounter with Arakaka and 62 days since leaving the Canary Islands, Bombard made landfall on the island of Barbados, 25 kilograms lighter and a year older, having turned 28 on the eighth day of his voyage. On his return to France, Bombard became an immediate celebrity and was hailed by the press as a hero. In 1955, his exploits would form the basis of his best-selling book, Voluntary Castaway. But not everyone was impressed. Bombard's harshest critic was German doctor and sailor Hannes Lindemann, whom Bombard had met in Tangier on the Mediterranean leg of his voyage. On October the 20th, 1956, Lindemann set off across the Atlantic alone in a collapsible kayak, modified with a sail and outrigger. 
Unlike Bombar, however, Lindemann carried 70 kilograms of provisions, including canned peas, evaporated milk, oranges, garlic, penicillin, and even a spear gun. But despite this, his 72-day, 4,800-kilometer voyage was no less harrowing than Bombar's, with Lindemann suffering the same delirium, hallucinations, and massive drop in body weight. Based on these experiences, Lindemann concluded that Bombar should have never survived the 62 days on fish, plankton, and seawater, and accused him of cheating, claiming in his book, Alone at Sea, that... Surely I took with me the least amount of food of any boat that has ever made the Atlantic crossing, at least much less than Arlene Bombar. In particular, Lindemann cited photos published in Bombar's book, which purportedly showed him taking on provisions from the Arakaka. However, there is no evidence that Bombar ever opened his sealed food reserves, and in any case, 53 days surviving on fish and plankton was more than enough to prove his point, and the French and Taiwanese navies certainly agreed with both carrying out extended survival exercises which confirmed the validity of Bombar's theories. Bombar became a world-renowned expert on survival at sea, helping to develop the survival curricula for several navies and designing a line of inflatable boats that still bears his name. Later in life, he entered politics, joining the French Socialist Party in 1972 and briefly becoming Minister of the Environment in 1981. From 1981 to 1994, he served as a deputy in the European Parliament, where he passionately took on a number of environmental and animal rights causes such as nuclear power, the hunting of baby seals, and the force feeding of geese to produce foie gras. Dr. Alain Bombard died of natural causes in Toulon on July the 19th, 2005, at the age of 80, a saviour to castaways everywhere. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. Again, thank you to Sheath for sponsoring it. There is a link to them below. And thank you for watching.